On May 16, 1958, British geologists scouting for oil-bearing rock in the Libyan desert saw something unusual, the wreckage of a World War II bomber. Oddly, the bomber was mostly intact, but it had crashed some 400 miles from the nearest World War II airbase in North Africa. When the wreckage was examined, the bomber had food, water, and even working equipment. Gone were the crew, parachutes, and strangely, life jackets. Thirteen years after the end of World War II, the discovery of a well-preserved bomber in the desert sparked a mystery surrounding the fate of the ghost plane of the Sahara. Hello and welcome to Anything History. As with any good story, this one starts with a mystery. The discovery of a well-preserved World War II bomber in the desert raised many questions. In today's video, we try to discover the fate of the ghost plane of the Sahara. In 1959, British oil company geologists surveying for oil-bearing strata found what appeared to be the wreck of an airplane, possibly a bomber, in the desert. After surveying the area, they noted the bomber's location, and on their return, they informed the nearby Wheelis Air Force Base about their find. Surprisingly, the Air Force Base did not have any knowledge of a plane that was missing in the region, and did not investigate further. The survey teams continued to report sightings of a downed bomber, and in March 1959, they dispatched a team for a closer examination of the crash site. The oil company deployed a three-member team led by Gordon Bowerman. They discovered a B-24D Liberator bomber, the Lady Be Good. The dry desert environment had preserved the aircraft. They found that the Lady Be Good had broken into two sections on landing, but was largely intact. Bowerman found the maintenance records and identified the air crew from clothing and equipment left behind. Amazingly, the plane had food, drinkable water, as well as a working radio and 30 caliber machine guns. However, no human remains were found. Gone were the parachutes and life jackets. Bowerman gathered details and wrote the commander of Wheelis Air Base, telling him about the lost bomber in the desert. The air base commander sent the information to the team at Army Quartermaster's Mortuary Service in Frankfurt. They agreed an official investigation was warranted. After being lost for 13 years, the tale of the Lady Be Good was about to be revealed. United States military authorities examined the Lady Be Good crash site between May and August 1959. The U.S. military's team conducted both ground and air searches of the area surrounding the Lady Be Good. But despite their persistent efforts, the team could not discover any trace of the crew's remains the shifting sands of the desert led the investigators to conclude that any remains that had been concealed were buried by the shifting sands of the Libyan desert. Although they didn't find the crew, they did recover some of their equipment, including parachutes and flight boots shaped into arrowhead markers. They believe the air crew had used these arrowhead markers to indicate the direction of their desperate march to potential search and rescue teams. Later in February 1960, after the official U.S. military investigation had ended, another British Petroleum Survey team discovered the remains of five crew members. Once the U.S. government learned about the discovery, they formed a joint U.S. Army Air Force expedition for a final search they named Operation Climax. Using jeeps, a C-130, and two Bell helicopters, they were able to better search the area and recovered the remains of Lieutenant Hatton, Toner, Hayes, Sergeant Adams, Sergeant Lamott, some 78 miles northwest of the crash site. Besides the air crew's remains, the task force found a lot of the air crew's personal items, canteens, flashlights, bits of parachutes, and flight jackets. Among all the items found, Lieutenant Robert Toner's diary was the most poignant. He wrote of the air crew's struggles in the staggering heat and cold desert nights, and how they endured these difficulties together. Because the air crew bailed out over what they thought was the Mediterranean Sea, they left most of their supplies of water on the plane. With only a half a canteen of water to split among them, the airmen traveled for eight days north in search of the coastline, covering some 78 miles from where they landed. The distance that they covered, with minimal water, in the desert heat, and cold, was a testament to their willingness to survive and work together. After finding five of the nine crew members, the military's mortuary service decided to keep looking for the rest of the crewmen. During this part of the investigation, they did find two more of the crewmen. Sergeant Shelley was found about 21 miles away from the rest of the crew. Sergeant Ripslinger was found even farther, another 26 miles from Sergeant Shelley. 
This meant that the last crewman of the Lady Be Good had traveled a staggering 125 miles from the crash site, despite having very little water in a hostile environment. An Operation Climax concluded with two of the Lady Be Good's crewmen still missing. Later in August 1960, British petroleum personnel made their last discovery when they found the remains of Lieutenant John Wervaka. It turned out that his parachute had not opened correctly when the rest of the crew had bailed out. But after all the searches, Sergeant Vernon Moore's remains were never found. With all the investigations complete, the final mission of the Lady Be Good was pieced together. On April 4, 1943, during a mission to bomb the Italian harbor of Naples, the Lady Be Good and its nine crew members took off from Saluk Air Force Base in Libya. On the return leg of their mission, the aircraft had radioed Saluk that their automatic direction finder had quit working, but did not receive a reply. To make matters worse, they had fallen behind their formation and were alone at night. The Lady Be Good now caught a tailwind that fooled the inexperienced crew into thinking their position was farther behind and that they were still over the Mediterranean Sea. It was the inexperience of the air crew that made their situation more dangerous. This was in part due to the rush training that the Army Air Corps had to undertake to get air crews ready for the war. It's an understatement to say that air crew training was rushed. By the end of the war, training accidents had accounted for over 13,000 fatalities and over 7,000 lost aircraft. It's understandable that the inexperienced crew, flying alone, in darkness, and with no direction finder, believed that they were still on course. As they continued to fly southeast, the Lady Be Good moved further and further away from their airbase. By 2 a.m., they had been in the air for 11 hours, and the engines began shutting down due to lack of fuel. The crew prepared to bail out, believing that they were going into the Mediterranean Sea. They left their food and most of the water on the plane. After the crew left the Lady Be Good, the bomber continued on its glide path and crashed wheels up 16 miles south of their location in the Libyan desert. After the bomber's disappearance, search and rescue efforts at the time found no trace of the Lady Be Good or its crew. They had just become another aircraft and crew lost to the fog of war. The lost airmen were roughly 450 miles south of Saluk Air Force Base, but the inexperienced crew believed they were far closer and set off northwards in search of the coastline. Sadly, their bomber, with its food, water, and more importantly, a working radio, was only 16 miles to the southeast. The mystery of the Lady Be Good and its crew captured the imagination of post-war America. It became a symbol for all the airmen and soldiers lost during the war. The tragic story of the Lady Be Good serves as a poignant reminder of the perils faced by servicemen during the war and the enduring mysteries that can linger years after a conflict has ended. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really does help the channel out.